everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Life is a Story We Tell Ourselves. Our guest today is Paul Rogers, natural resources and environmental writer for the San Jose Mercury News. He writes about energy, water policy, and parks, among other things. And he was a member of the Mercury News Pulitzer Prize winning team that covered the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1990. So welcome to the podcast, Paul. It's good to have you. Great to see you again, Don. Yeah, it's been a while. I always uh, enjoy getting to see my old uh, friends and and do some catching up. But uh, let's get right to it. I have uh, several questions I, I wanted to uh, ask you. And the first one has to do with, you know, why did you become a journalist in the first place? Was there some influence in your life when you were a little kid or somewhere along the line that uh, set you off in this direction, especially an environmental journalist? Yeah, you know, um, journalism is a is a funny career because you really get a lot of wonderful access. You sort of get a front row seat to history. Uh, you get to meet amazing people, go to amazing places. Uh, you also come under a lot of heat from the public because you write things that people don't like. And so um, I wish I could say that uh, I had a great uh, epiphany as a young person, um, you know, uh, with uh, watching uh, Edward R. Murrow or, or reading the New York Times or something like that, reading about uh, uh, John Peter Zenger and the early uh, foundations of, of American democracy. Actually, I wanted to be a movie director when I was a kid. Um, uh. I read a lot of comic books. I read some newspapers, but I used to make little movies with an eight millimeter camera and I would take clay models and I would make things like dinosaurs and you know, alligators, and I'd have them chase people around, and I'd do this sort of frame-by-frame frame thing, and I thought, if I could get paid to do this, this would be great, and I went, and I told my parents, I want to be a movie director, and they said, oh, you're never going to make any money, and, and so I, I sort of thought, well, what's, what's the next thing I could do? Maybe I could go into television and make television, and so uh, when I graduated from high school in Cincinnati, Ohio, I, uh, I went to Indiana University and I became a telecommunications major. As part of that, you had to do a couple of journalism classes. And so I went down mm -hmm. to uh, Ernie Pyle Hall, the journalism building. I had an old manual Royal typewriter from the 1940s that was there at the school. And I learned uh, how to interview people and I loved it. And I thought it was the funnest thing you could ever do. And pretty soon, a couple of years later, I was covering uh, the 1988 presidential campaign for this newspaper. Mm -hmm. I was going to see Ronald Reagan speak and other people speak. And I would write stories and then compare what I had written to what the real reporters at the Chicago Tribune or the Louisville <laughs> Courier Journal or those places. And I learned more doing that than anything else. And uh, I really uh, never looked back. And I've been doing it ever since I was uh, 19 years old. So you were a storyteller. I mean, it sounded like to me from what you said, you wanted to tell stories from the time that you were young. And I can tell from your your writing, I mean, I've been reading your stuff and you've written about me and, uh, you know, they were all stories uh, and, and great stories. Uh, and uh, that's why I wanted you on the show, because this is life is a story we tell ourselves. And I think journalists are storytellers. And um, that's a lot of the, the motivation. And I think the best of the journalists uh, somehow tease out, you know, those stories that mean a lot to us in life and make people have their own individual insights into things. So my next question is, tell me, what's the state of uh, environmental journalism in, in the U.S. today? I mean, I read the papers and look at the news. I, I hardly see the environment mentioned at all anymore. Yeah, it's, it's tough. You know, journalism has in industry, uh, particularly newspaper journalism, has really um, lost a lot of capacity in the last uh, 20 years, basically. You know, the newspapers used to be incredibly powerful profit centers because they were the only game in town. Uh, you know, uh, if you owned a printing press, you had all the power uh, to um, earn revenue from ads. We remember the days when uh, if you had a garage sale, you had to pay 50 or 100 bucks for a a little help wanted ad, right? Uh, three or four lines in the back of the sure. paper. And newspaper publishers used to make hundreds of millions of dollars um, with that monopoly. Um, but then what happened, um, well, and, and let me back up, because of all that profit, that enabled them to have very large staffs, um, hundreds of reporters spread all over the world in foreign bureaus, uh, people who um, could specialize uh, in certain uh, uh, beats. And then what happened with the internet coming along 
uh, the three ways that newspapers made money all were dramatically disrupted. So uh, those three ways are by selling subscriptions to the newspaper, because now you can get a lot of it for free online, right? The weather, the sports scores, movie reviews. Uh, second are what we call display ads, you know, ads for, for movies or department stores, things like that. Uh, a lot of those migrated online. Uh, and finally are those help wanted ads that I mentioned. Now people don't take out help wanted ads. They put ads on Craig, Craigslist and they sell things on eBay. And so what's happened is the revenues that newspapers used to make have gone way, way, way down. And so they don't have the profits. And even though there are more people than ever reading the news online, the traditional business model of newspapers is broken. And newspapers are reinventing themselves right now where they're trying to sell people online subscriptions. But putting the toothpaste back in the tube when people have been used to getting it for free is challenging. And all that is to say, with less revenue, there are fewer reporters. Um, there's more consolidation in the industry. And I think um, there are some bright spots. Uh, there are a lot of new, really talented online publications, you know, everybody from uh, Vox to ProPublica. And so we're seeing a lot of institutions that didn't even exist 20 years ago. But um, this, this fracturing of media and a lot of the money going online has really hurt newspapers. Um, it's also affecting a lot of for-profit TV and radio coverage. Uh, you've seen growth in the last uh, decade in NPR stations. You know, there are 900 NPR stations in the United States. Right. And uh, they've been doing pretty well because they have a different business model, right? It's based on um, members. And so uh, they have taken up some of the slack, but it's it's still a difficult time, difficult time for journalists at a time when we need journalism and democracy uh, to shine a light on things more than ever. Well, is some of it, does some of it have to do with the fact that um, there are so many other things that are going on in the world today that uh, envir the environment, environmentalism, the environmental movement uh, takes a, has taken a back seat to those things? I think some of that is true. Uh, it is hard to argue with editors when we have the worst pandemic in 100 years going on around the world. We have the biggest challenge to the United States since World War II um, that other stories should take precedence over that immediate, you know, house on fire kind of coverage. So just like when we have a big earthquake in California, uh, this story, uh, the COVID story, is sort of an all hands on deck where it doesn't really matter what your beat is and everybody covers um, the news. And that's happening at all uh, media companies. Um, I do think also though that part of the coverage is driven by what leaders do. Uh, so in California, when Jerry Brown was governor over the last eight years, as you know, he focused a lot on renewable energy, uh, climate change, ways that states and localities could lead. Uh, and so there were a lot of stories written in California about electric cars and solar power and things that uh, governments could do to encourage those. Um, and, and so when leaders set agendas, whatever those may be, whether it's Teddy Roosevelt in national parks, uh, Richard Nixon with the EPA, uh, Jerry Brown with climate change, the coverage follows that. Um, we also cover breaking news. As you remember in 1989, when the Exxon Valdez uh, hit Bly Reef uh, in Alaska, um, suddenly every network TV uh, uh, station beefed up their environmental coverage. You know, CNN created an environment team. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, President Bush uh, went to, Bush one went to some global summits uh, talking about climate change and other environmental issues. So. The coverage kind of waxes and wanes, um, you know, based on what leaders are doing and based on uh, what else is happening. Well, you mentioned what leaders are doing, and of course, the most recent press in the environment has to do, it's, it's a negative story, if you love the environment, uh, that is, and it um, has to do with the recent uh, decisions from the Trump administration to roll back some of the uh, NEPA regulations, supposedly to make it easier for uh, work uh, to be done mostly from by government uh, agencies. And so uh, there has been uh, a lot of environmental uh, articles and press around negative things. And as you say, 
things that leadership has done, particularly in, in this administration. Yeah, I mean, um, the interesting thing about President Trump and the environment, um, his administration has worked to roll back dozens and dozens of environmental laws and standards, uh, some of which go back to President Nixon, as you mentioned, um, you know, NEPA. Uh, as I recall, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, was passed in 1969. It's basically the law that requires people, for folks who don't know, requires uh, environmental impact reports for big projects. And, um, you know, what's been happening is, as the Trump administration weakens or, or chips away at some of these laws, they are often sued by environmental groups and states, and it doesn't quite get as much coverage, but those folks filing the lawsuits are winning uh, a lot of these lawsuits. Um, in some cases, uh, 70, 80, 90% of these rule changes have been blocked. I did a story last year about how California has consistently been blocking and outsmarting the Trump administration. You know, the Trump administration was pushing for more offshore oil drilling off the coast of California. So Jerry Brown signed a law that made it uh, illegal to build new pipelines in state waters from the shoreline out to three miles. So you can put an offshore oil rig 10 miles offshore in federal waters, but you can't get the oil at the shore. So those kind of things. Um, and as you know, when administrations change, um, things flip quickly. So I anticipate a lot of these laws that aren't, or these lawsuits that aren't settled, if, uh, if Joe Biden wins a presidency, what his administration will do is settle many of them very quickly on terms that basically roll back what Trump had done and put it back to the original. So uh, there's a lot at stake in the election. And a lot of strategy uh, going on. And that leads me to ask, uh, so what are the, what are the biggest challenges that are uh, confronting the environment today? You know, it, it's, it's a great question. Um, and one of the things that I've, tried to work hard on over my career is to remind people that the world isn't just about failures. There's a lot of successes that happen in the world. There are a lot of people who've worked very hard to make the world better. And um, sometimes that gets lost in news coverage, particularly in environmental news coverage. Uh, the old joke is it's not news when the plane takes off safely. Um, but when it comes to the environment, uh, there are enormous successes over the last 50 years. You know, we've, uh, we've got dramatically cleaner air than we had uh, in the 1970s uh, because of the Clean Air Act and other laws. We have dramatically clean water. Basically, every community in America has recycling when others didn't. We've got um, electric cars uh, coming out in big numbers. Uh, species that were once endangered have recovered and come off the endangered species list, like gray whales, bald eagles, brown pelicans, American alligators. Um, we're seeing enormous growth in renewable energy. 34% uh, of California's electricity is now generated from solar, wind, or other renewables. 34%. And that's going to go uh, to 60% um, by uh, 2030. So there's a lot good that's happening, um, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. The biggest challenge is still, um, number one, clearly, is climate change. Um, the 10 hottest years on Earth uh, since 1880, when we first began uh, modern temperature records, 140 years ago. The 10 hottest years have all happened since 1998. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen uh, a, a jump in forest fires across California and the West. We've seen a diminishment of snowpack, which is key for water supplies across the West. Um, we've seen sea level rise. Um, we've seen droughts made worse. So this isn't um, some distant threat that's going to affect our great grandchildren. It's already playing out. Uh, we're seeing higher numbers of heat illnesses and deaths um, in, in places. You know, it's been 118 degrees in Phoenix for the last few days. So you get to a level when temperatures get there where airplanes can't take off anymore from airports because uh, the aerodynamics no longer work. And so uh, this is real. Uh, it's, it's getting worse. Uh, we do still have time to blunt the worst of it. Uh, but we really, really got to uh, get on it in the next 10 to 15 years and make significant progress. Um, I just mentioned one other thing. Um, you know, there are obviously uh, uh, wildlife success stories, but there are a lot of um, 
wildlife problems, uh, particularly in the oceans. Uh, some of that is related to climate change and decline of fisheries and overfishing. But the, this issue of plastic pollution has become a much bigger issue, oh, yes. uh, I think, in the last mm -hmm. few years. You know, um, there are just some um, some incredible uh, uh, facts about uh, about plastic that a lot of people are just starting to realize. Like half of all the plastic that's ever existed on Earth was made in the last 13 years. And only 9% of the plastic in the United States that's sold every year is recycled. So what happens to the rest of it? It's not just here, it's in China and other places. Um, about 13 million tons of it a year ends up in the oceans. Now that's the equivalent of a garbage truck full of plastic being dumped into the sea every single minute, every minute in perpetuity. It kills fish, birds, sea turtles, whales, Dolphins eat it, other you know, animals eat it, they become entangled with it, it lasts for hundreds of years, uh, it takes petroleum to make it, uh, and at the current rate, some studies have shown, um, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean by 2050 than fish, uh, and most of it is broken into tiny little bits of confetti floating just below the surface, so that is something we've got to get a handle on as well. Right. Well, there have been success stories, I understand, around uh, plastic uh, cleanup as well. There are numerous um, <clears throat> philanthropic efforts and uh, mm -hmm. numerous uh, companies uh, have realized that, that it's a problem. But um, it sounds like the problem is so big, it's going to be difficult, like climate change, to, to get a handle on and to get ahead of. Yeah, I think um, this is one where once it gets into the ocean, I mean, there's some really well-meaning attempts to go and get it and clean it up. But the oceans are so vast, as you know, it's, it's very difficult um, when you think of, like you can sail for a thousand miles off the West Coast and, and not hit anything. And think of like two or three sizes, two or three Texases out there and having to like mow the grass back and forth with the boat to pick it up. It, it, it just is mind boggling. So a lot of experts I talk to say, you know, the solution is kind of twofold. You, you need to require companies to make compostable plastic uh, and also um, laws which would require the companies that make it to be responsible for it. Um, California has a couple of bills pending uh, right now that would basically require them to set up recycling programs and then to them to take it back and them to be, to reduce the, the volume um, so that it's not something that corporations are creating and then the rest of us are left to, to pick up. Yeah, you know, when you ignore the environmental uh, impact, you're also ignoring or not factoring in all of the, uh, the economic aspects of, of what you're doing. So you mentioned the responsibility of these, these companies when they uh, do their ledgers, generally speaking, um, and, and try to say, well, what's the bottom line? Of course, they don't figure in um, the cost uh, of environmental pollution or the cost of what's happening to their, uh, with their products, which they should figure in. And even if we as consumers end up having to pay more, that's far better than having to pay with the destruction of our oceans in the future. So why not yeah. pay 50 cents more for a comp uh, compostable uh, plastic container uh, than having to pay in untold uh, death and destruction in, in the oceans. It just, uh, it makes absolutely no sense. And, and companies need to take responsibility. And as, and as you know, there are, from being in state government and federal government, there are lots of different ways to go after some of these things. You can offer incentives for companies. You can, you can put a tiny fee on something that everybody buys to help, uh, to help create uh, grants and other funding pots for things. Um, you know, it, we, we require different levels of accountability in, in different industries. You know, uh, the mining industry, and they don't always do it that great, but they're required when they, when they dig a mine to, to reclaim it and to clean it up when they're finished. And, um, you know, if you rent a house from somebody, you have to pick up the garbage before you get your right. deposit back, right? It's, exactly. it's, so it's not a new concept. Yeah, it's, it's not. Well, I hope uh, you'll keep writing about those things and put pressure on those folks to make those, uh, those kinds of uh, changes. Uh, Don, let me let me just let, let me just mention one other thing that I that I did uh, mention that's really important. Oh sure, um, absolutely. You know, it, the, the environmental justice issue I think is is uh, so important. Um, no. We have we have seen pollution affect different groups of people in society differently. Uh, whether it's 
uh, farm workers in California being exposed to pesticides uh, or having drinking water that um, doesn't meet health standards because there are chemicals in it uh, or uh, whether we see uh, communities of color in places near ports like uh, Long Beach or the Port of Oakland um, where you have a lot of diesel pollution. You know, diesel pollution, um, and I've been covering this a little bit lately because California has been passing tougher rules on trucks, but there's about 40 different carcinogens in diesel soot. Diesel is used all over the world, and um, those particles are arguably the most dangerous type of air pollution. They lodge deep in people's lungs. They can uh, exacerbate asthma, heart disease. They cause cancer. And as we do more and more science on this, we find that the people who live closest to freeways, within 500 feet of, of highways, have the highest burden. Um, the people who live near ports with all the trucks and all the ships have the mm -hmm. highest burden. And so uh, you see high rates of asthma in a lot of, a lot of communities. Um, and it, it's clearly a, uh, it's a civil rights issue as much as it's an environmental issue. And I think society writ large uh, needs to focus more on that. Yes, and, and there was a, a focus on it at, at one time. It's interesting how these things wax and wane, and we're going to talk about the Land and Water Conservation Fund in, in a minute. Um, but several years ago, uh, there was a, a real focus on environmental justice. Uh, a lot of resources went into it. It was uh, something that was written about um, a lot. And I'm always interested in a, in a storytelling or a journalistic way how certain things kind of just fall out of favor, even though they're extremely important, people stop paying attention to them. And, um, and so you as a journalist, how do you get, you know, people to, to listen when certain things, people just go, oh, well, that's old news. And you, I guess you as a journalist hear that all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's tough. You know, the root word of newspaper is new, right? So yes. it's like, what do you got for me today? What's new? Tell me something I don't know. And, right. and I think um, that's one of the shortcomings of a lot of journalism is, we love to cover the big breaking thing, but then the follow-up uh, isn't always as good as it can be. And part of that is because um, a lot of folks don't cover beats for a long time. So we have new people coming in and out all the time. There isn't the institutional memory sometimes. Sometimes it's, as I mentioned earlier, what are the leaders focusing on? Um, a lot of times to get broad news coverage, you need what we in the business call a news peg or a news hook. Like what is the reason for doing this story now? You know, what's happening? Is there a new lawsuit? Is there a new, um, you know, pollution incident? Is, is there a new bill being introduced? Is there a protest? We, we need sort of something to cover usually in the journalism world. Um, it's not that hard to find those hooks, but um, when you have fewer journalists in general because of the economic issues I mentioned earlier, it's harder to free people up um, to not just be covering the breaking news. And on top of that, when you have this 24 hour news cycle now where everything we write has got to be posted right away on the web, we send it out on social media, which is great for the public, they get all the news quick. But for journalists, it means, you know, you're quickly trying to post breaking news quite often. And there's less time to do the step back analysis, contextual kind of stories. Yeah understand. Well, I mentioned the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and I kind of want to segue to, to talk about uh, that. There is a new uh, effort to revitalize the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and I'll just say a few words a, a, about it to, to introduce the, the subject. The Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, was uh, first enacted way back in 1965. It was uh, funded by Outer Continental Shelf Oil Royalties, and it was uh, meant to be an even split of funding between state and local and federal funding for everything from uh, new parks and, and open space uh, to fish and wildlife uh, preserves uh, to playgrounds uh, in cities. And uh, the fund, the Land and Water Conservation Fund has not been fully funded. It was originally uh, close to a billion dollar uh, fund uh, that was supposed to, again, be split evenly between the states and, uh, and federal uh, mandates or federal 
uh, purchases. So a lot of our, our national parks were purchased with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Most of our playgrounds uh, in cities were built with Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, money. Uh, I think it was one of the most important acts ever enacted in the United States. I personally call it the act that saved America because most people don't understand that the lands and waters, and, and there's a book actually written on this. I wish I could remember the name of it for our, our folks, but uh, at the beginning of the book, it talks about the reason that America is the country it is today is because of its lands and its waters and how its lands and waters are configured geographically, uh, how they're preserved. And so the Land and Water Conservation Act did things that actually made uh, America a stronger country. And it's hard for, to get people to see those connections. You've written about it a lot. So why don't you may, uh, tell us uh, about this new act, the Great American Outdoors Act that uh, recently passed the Senate and, and the recent efforts to try to revitalize the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Yeah, this, this new law is a big deal. And, and let me just say first, I really, <clears throat> I agree with you. Uh, those who watched the Ken Burns PBS special about national parks, uh, remember he called national parks uh, America's best idea. Um, now, I happen to disagree. I think the Bill of Rights is America's best idea, but mm -hmm. National Parks is very close uh, <laughs> behind that. And if you think about it, the concept of parks, national parks, state parks, local parks, is one of the most profoundly democratic ideas that you can have. It says, let's break thousands of years of tradition and say the best places in nature aren't just for rich people. They're not just for, the, for kings. It's not the king's lands that you can't go in. Um, the best places, the Yosemites, the Grand Canyons, um, the, the Acadias, the, you know, places like that are for everybody, no matter what your station in life, or no matter how much money you have or how little money you have. And that to me is a profoundly important American idea. And uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, as you say, started in the 1960s. It started in the Eisenhower administration uh, yes. out of a task force looking at like, what do we do with all these kids from the, from the you know, they're coming back after the war, the baby boom. We got to have places for them to go on vacation and places for them to play Little League Baseball. And so, uh, as you say, it was a genius move to say, let's take the royalties these companies are paying to the government to drill for offshore oil. It's not a new tax. They're already paying it. Let's put $900 million a year into national parks, uh, state parks, local parks. Um, I looked up some of the way that money's been spent um, over the last 56 years or so. It's literally the most important tool in the United States for preserving public land. It's preserved everything from Redwood National Park in California to Cape Cod National Seashore to Martin Luther King's boyhood home in Atlanta. Uh, it completed the Appalachian Trail. It's bought out old mining claims in Denali National Park in Alaska. It's expanded lands on the Big Sur Coast. Uh, you know, filled in areas in the Crown Jewel Parks, uh, Olympic, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Yellowstone, that would have had development in them mm -hmm. because they were little private inholdings. Um, it's also funded more than 40,000 swimming pools, soccer fields, baseball diamonds, fishing piers, playgrounds, things that everybody, again, from all walks of life and communities uh, use and need. And uh, I'm going to be a little less diplomatic than you. Uh, people, uh, <laughs> politicians in both parties have stolen that money. The yes, last 30 have. years, they take, they've taken the money from offshore oil royalties. They haven't spent it the way the law was intended. They've used it for other things. And now, and I know you worked on this so much when you were at the National Park Service, we've, we have a huge maintenance backlog at national parks. It's more than $10 billion, roads, visitor centers, all that. And so this... Great Outdoors Act, uh, which passed uh, the, the Senate uh, just a couple of weeks ago with, uh, I believe it was almost 75 votes, it was a bipartisan measure, um, would do two things. It would permanently require all $900 million to go to parks and not to be diverted, uh, which is a big deal. Second, it would set aside 9.5 billion with a B over five years to pay down the maintenance backlog at national parks and other public lands agencies, uh, the National Forest, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, et cetera. 
but about 70% of that money is gonna to go to national parks and that'll pay down half of the backlog. Um, it is, uh, I've written and I argue, the most important conservation, piece of conservation legislation in the United States in 40 years since Jimmy Carter signed the Alaska National Interest Land Act, uh, which doubled the size of the National Park Service in 1980 and created a lot of new national parks in Alaska. Uh, this bill is coming up for a vote in the House uh, sometime in the next few weeks. President Trump has said he'll sign it. And some folks might say, well, why are Republicans for this? Uh, you know, many of the things that in the Trump administration uh, have, have not been, uh, you know, in the same vein as what environmentalists want. We've pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, those kind of things. Well, there's a political reason. There are a couple of Republican senators who are in danger of losing their seats in November in the West. Uh, Cory Gardner in Colorado uh, and um, uh, Steve Daines in Montana. And those guys are the co-sponsors of this bill. And basically they need something to come back to their constituents with to show that they've accomplished something important. And, uh, you know, Environmentalists are saying, we see a rare opportunity here to work together. I expect the bill will pass the House. Nancy Pelosi supports uh, this stuff. And again, Donald Trump has said he'll sign it. So we'll see. We may have uh, a rare bit of uh, bipartisan landmark environmental legislation in the next month or two. Well, that would be great, I, I, for, especially for me to see in my lifetime. There are always these windows. My son told me the name of it. There's a, a name for a window to get things done, and I can't think of the name of it. It's a funny name, but politically, there's a name for a window for getting things done. And so we had a window back in the 1990s when I worked on this, and of course, unfortunately, it didn't pass. That window closed. That was 30 years ago. And yeah. it's unbelievable for me to look back and say that that was uh, 30 years ago. And now 30 years later, another window is open and I'm, I'm so hopeful that, uh, that this time this legislation is going to pass. It would be long overdue. Uh, and, and thank you for, for writing about it and bringing it to the attention of, of all, the, all the readers out there. So um, again, this is a, a little bit different. You also do a lot of uh, science writing and um, I'm really interested in, in hearing from you about your, your science writing. But I have a specific question about that. And then maybe you can talk more generally about your science writing. But uh, what scientific discoveries um, you know, have you written about uh, recently? And what do you think, um, out of those scientific things that you've written about, what's going to have the greatest impact on humanity for the longest time? There's such a huge range um, you know, in the short term. And this seems obvious. but. Whoever invents uh, the vaccine for COVID is gonna be remembered for a long time. Uh, that's obviously something many of the world's top scientists are working on. Uh, we've also seen some amazing uh, advances in space. You know, we thought 50 years ago that space was all about uh, astronauts uh, walking around on the moon and getting in rocket ships. But what we've seen in recent years is you don't have to have astronauts to make amazing discoveries. You know, we. Um, we have projects um, <clears throat> like the Kepler project that NASA uh, runs to, to look for other planets like Earth out yeah, in the solar planets, system. Exoplanets, yeah. Exoplanets and, and in the universe, yeah. And we've found more than 2,000 of those, which is pretty amazing, uh, including many that are in the so-called Goldilocks zone, you know, where you're not too, too cold, you're too far away from a sun, uh, and you're not too hot, then nothing can live there. So uh, the next step, of course, is to point our radio telescopes at those Goldilocks planets that look like they might have some promise and listen to see if they're making any noise. Um, that to me is fascinating. Um, you know, on the environmental front, um, I think the invention of the electric car uh, is, is profoundly important. When you look at how much of climate change comes from transportation, and depending on where you are, it's, it's you know, like a third of the emissions or more. <clears throat> um, electric cars just 10 years ago were a tiny niche for hobbyists. And um, now there are more than half a million driving around in California. Mm -hmm. um, the prices are coming way down. Uh, there are a number of European countries, I want to say six or seven, that have banned the sale of new cars with internal combustion engines starting in 2030 or 2035. 
Um, and I think it's something that you could see California do in the next few years. I, I could see uh, the Biden administration doing something like that if Biden uh, is elected. So, you know, we're never going to probably do away with traffic, but um, the idea that cars have to be a major source of pollution um, is fast coming to an end. And um, cars have already gotten so much cleaner over the last 30 or 40 years. We banned leaded gasoline. Um, we have catalytic converters. We have smog checks. Um, the average new car you burn today that burns gasoline emits one or two percent of the tailpipe pollution than a car in the 1980s, you know, even an SUV. Uh, so cars are dramatically cleaner. That's a big part of the reason that smog is going down in a lot of places. But electric cars uh, are the next step to really reduce our, our fossil fuel consumption. Well, it's interesting that, that you mentioned, you know, cars. And of course, cars are about transportation except if you look at Madison Avenue, they say they're about everything other than transportation and that's how they sell them. Uh, but that's another uh, story altogether. But it does lead me to ask, um, what's happened in, in California to the focus on high-speed rail and, and transportation uh, profile changing so that people can get out of their cars and get around a, a lot easier? Um, it's kind of multi-pronged. Uh, a lot of the regional transportation, uh, alternative transportation efforts, public transportation have been expanding. So in the Bay Area where, where I live, uh, BART, the Bay Area Rapid uh, Transit System, which runs around the Bay, uh, we've been spending billions of dollars to expand that. And finally, it comes into the heart of Silicon Valley, where we just opened several new stations near San Jose. Uh, and BART had been around for 50 years and didn't go to San Jose, which is the most populous city in the Bay Area. Um, we're seeing expansion of uh, public transit in Los Angeles as well. I think the issue with high-speed rail, um, it's still an untold story. It's still a question mark. You know, voters in 2008 in California approved uh, $9 billion in a bond act for high-speed rail. It was close, the election was close, and a lot of folks believe that the only thing that saved that measure was the fact that uh, Barack Obama was on the ballot. And a lot of young people turned out, a lot of folks who don't normally vote turned out. Obama won the state in a landslide and high-speed rail, which was on that ballot, just barely squeaked through. Um, then we had uh, the a recession. Uh, it was hard to raise money for it. Um, there've been a lot of cost overruns. Um, you know, Governor New it was Jerry Brown, this was his project, Governor Newsom, is not as big of a supporter of it. Uh, he's still on board, he hasn't killed it. Um, but there are, there are real challenges, real questions about whether it's ever gonna get built. There's, there's challenges about um, you know, how to get it into the Los Angeles area where there's all sorts of you know, underground uh, oil formations and things you gotta tunnel through and um, getting it through mountain ranges. And um, mm. I, you know, I'm not sure that it's ever gonna be built uh, you know, in my lifetime, maybe, uh, but it's, uh, it's very expensive and California is very spread out. As you know, California is like 800 miles long. And so cynics will say, hey, if I wanna to go to Los Angeles, I can buy a ticket for $100 to go from San Francisco to Los Angeles on Southwest Airlines. Mm -hmm. um, and a high-speed rail ticket is gonna to have to cost more than that um, unless it takes a lot of subsidies. So maybe they can work it out. They worked it out in China and Japan and other countries, but many of those places are much more dense in terms of the populations. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Well, as an environmental journalist, um, I'm sure you've had a, a chance to visit our public lands and our national parks. Any stories you have about uh, visits to, to national parks or uh, time you and your family may have spent uh, out in the environment and out in the wilderness? I, I, love, uh, I love this job, Don. Um, and I know your work in parks, you're coming from a lot of the same places. Um, that I am, but isn't it amazing to get paid to go to parks, to get paid to go to Yosemite, to get paid to go to Big Basin Redwoods Park or Big Sur? In, indeed. I, I, I think um, we're, we're blessed to have that opportunity. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of wonderful experiences in parks in this country and in other places like, uh, you know, Brazil and uh, Samoa and other places where I've gone to do stories. But, um, one funny story that comes to mind, um, I was writing a piece uh, on one of the anniversaries of the Exxon Valdez spill. Uh, I don't know what, maybe the 10th anniversary, I think it was. 
And I went up to Alaska. And the story was basically a contrarian story about how, yes, this was the biggest oil spill disaster that uh, America had ever seen up to that point. But a bizarre thing happened. You know, there were so many fines on Exxon, billion dollar fine, and there were trustee councils set up and stuff, that um, a lot of that money went to buy hundreds of thousands of acres of land in Alaska. I think the total is like 500,000, 600,000 acres of land for us that would have been clear cut. And uh, I remember saying to Bruce Babbitt when he was interior secretary, I said, this looks kind of weird, but in the long run, is the Exxon Valdez spill gonna be a good thing for the environment? You know, <laughs> and he sort of said, you're never gonna get me to say that, but you know, <laughs> um, and, and I think um, when I was up there doing that story, I had been working really hard. Um, I was on the Kenai Peninsula near Kenai Fjords National Park. And I said to myself, before I come back to California, I have to get at least one good hike in. I've been interviewing all these people. And so I went to a place called Exit Glacier. It was about 10 o'clock at night. It was just outside the little town of Seward, Alaska. And it was still light because it's light in Alaska that late sometimes of the year. And I was hiking along this river. I, I had parked my car in a gravel road. I'd walked about two miles. And I heard this noise down by the river. And I thought, I wonder if that's like a raccoon or a deer or something. And I walked a little further and I looked and there was this grizzly bear, probably, you know, 100 feet away from me. And I realized like, this isn't good. I'm here all by myself. And it w went up on its hind legs and it was looking around and sniffing, you know, the way grizzly bears do when you see them in movies, mm. but not when they're right in front of you. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> what do I do? And so I turned around and I started quickly walking the other way, trying not to make any noise. And I got in a couple of hundred yards and I heard this crashing through the brush behind me. And the first thing that flashed through my head is, I gotta climb a tree. And I realized there's no trees around here. The second thing that flashed through my head is, what is my obituary gonna look like in the newspaper? You know, environment <laughs> reporter eaten by a bear. And, uh, and then I thought, no, I think you're supposed to fall on the ground and cover your ears and just take it. And I, I was looking around for a rock or something to grab and I was about to fall on the ground and I peeked under my arm and he was running the other way. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I have been a, a runner in high school. I ran cross country in high school and I ran faster than at any time I had ever been since in high school, all the way back those two miles to my car. And I drove back down to Seward into a bar that was full of fishermen. And I said to the bartender, give me a drink. I just saw a grizzly bear up near Exit Glacier. And he goes, oh yeah, there were two people who were eating up there not too long ago. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. So anyway, that's my grizzly bear story. I hope well, I, I am so repeat that. <laughs> I'm so happy you survived. <laughs> well, any of us that have uh, spent any time in Alaska have some uh, some bear stories uh, to tell. And uh, I'm glad that bear decided to turn around and go. <laughs> What a what a wonderful story. Well, Paul, it's been a, a great pleasure uh, talking to you and and getting the perspective of a journalist and award winning journalist. And I hope you ha to have you back on the program sometime soon. Thanks, thanks I'd for be, joining us, Paul. I'd be happy to do it. Keep up the great work, Don. <laughs> Please make sure to join us in the upcoming weeks for interviews with many interesting new guests, including a wildlife conservationist and a travel writer. To stay up to date on more upcoming exciting interviews, please subscribe to the podcast. Don't forget to like the podcast and share it with your family and friends. From our family to yours, stay safe, share happiness, and remember, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. Thank you.